Hotel. Hey, this is Michael M. Hotel, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecturer, writer, and historian. And we want to say uh, Happy New Year to everybody. Happy holidays. And a lot of people have been asking how can they advertise with the African History Network. And we just brought on uh, a few new advertisers. So I want you, I want to let you know how you can start 2022 off right and advertise your um, African-American owned business with the African History Network. OK, so we reach thousands of people on a daily basis and you can advertise on my uh, show when we rebroadcast uh, the African History Network show on our social media platforms. But we're also on 10 different audio podcast platforms um, as well. OK, everything from iHeartRadio to FM Player, TuneIn, CastBox, Stitcher, Blog Talk Radio. So our current promotion uh, right now for a very limited time only is um, buy one month, get two months free. Buy one month, get two months free. All right. And we take your 30 second and 60 second commercial. We put into the uh, audio podcast of our shows. We also put into the rebroadcast of our shows as well. We rebroadcast uh, my shows throughout the day and um, also into the audio podcast of the shows. We can create a commercial for you if you don't have one. Uh, or you can submit one to us as well. Uh, email us at email us at ahn show at african history network dot com. Email us at ahn show at african history network dot com uh, for more information. And we have a, a a deep rich history in cooperative economics as well. We're going to talk about that some also. So, regardless of what type of uh, business you have. Uh, you may have a, uh, e-commerce business. You may have a brick and mortar business. Uh, you may sell, um, African cultural products, African garb, um, uh, uh, books, soaps, d different things like this, African-American, uh, clothing, et cetera, health and beauty products, uh, a really big clothing, shoes, uh, African garb. Uh, you may be a book author, okay, or you may sell books, especially African history books, African American history books. Uh, it could be um, African American books that are fiction, but uh, something that's really big are uh, books for children, positive uh, uh, books for children that show um, positive images of African Americans. Uh, you may have a educational business. You may do homeschooling or uh, produce curriculums or courses or teach financial literacy, things like this. OK, so you want to advertise with the African History Network. Uh, email us at AHN show at African History Network dot com. AHN show at African History Network dot com. And uh, we'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. Our current promotion is uh, buy one month, get two months free buy one month get two months free also african-american business owners post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast as well okay so we have a deep rich history of um cooperative economics all right and we know that the fourth principle of kwanzaa is ujima which means cooperative economics but a lot of people don't know the uh history that African-Americans have dealing with the co-ops and cooperative economics. Uh, there's a good book from uh, Dr. Jessica Gordon Nimhard, uh, Collective Courage, Collective Courage, that deals with the history, uh, a deep rich history that we have with co-ops. And uh, Collective Courage, a history of African-American cooperative economic thought and practice, okay? And I interviewed her back in 2014 and there's also a good article from AtlantaBlackStar.com that talks about this. So we're going to deal with a little bit of the history of um, African-Americans engaged in cooperative economics as well. Uh, now, the black cooperative uh, movement has always been parallel to the black liberation movements and civil and, and civil rights movements. We've mostly heard about the political side of the movement, but you can't name a major black political leader that did not point to cooperatives as a path to freedom. Whether you're talking about Dr. King, Malcolm X, Dr. W.B. Du Bois, Booker T. Washington, we know the Colored Merchants Association, which we'll talk about in a minute, comes out of the um, National Negro Business League, okay? 
All right, now, if we uh, look at this here, now, Dr. Dr. W.B. Dubois in 1935 said, there exists today a chance for blacks to organize a cooperative, a cooperative state within their own group by letting Negro farmers be Negro artisans and Negro technicians guide black home industries and black thinkers uh, plan, uh, black thinkers plan this integration of cooperation while black artists dramatize and beautify the struggle. Economic independence can be achieved to doubt that is po to, to doubt that this is possible is to doubt the essential humanity and the equality of brains of black people. All right. So when we look at our history, what well, you could read uh, before uh, before the Mayflower by Lerone Bennett Jr. But Collective Courage is a really good book that focuses on uh, history and entrepreneurship and and in uh, specifically the cooperatives and the the concept of the cooperatives are are principles we brought with us from Africa. Okay, especially West Africa. There's a good article from uh, AtlantaBlackStar.com that deals with uh, five historic examples of cooperative economics that advance the black community. One of them, they talk about the Susu system, okay, which we see uh, popular in West Africa and the Caribbean. And in parts of West Africa um, and the Caribbean, an ancient version of cooperative economics exists called Susu. As one of the oldest forms of microfinance in Africa, the practice is run by one of Africa's oldest financial groups known as Susu collectors. They run their businesses from kiosks in the marketplace and act as mobile bankers. Clients uh, make low but regular deposits on a daily or weekly basis over the course of a month into a Susu account. At the end of this period, the Susu collector returns the accumulated savings to the client, but keeps one day's savings as commission. Now, Susu collectors may also provide advances to their clients or rotate uh, the accumulated deposits of a group between individual members. Today, Susu collectors provide many West Africans who would otherwise be denied credit with access to money they need to start up small venture projects that in many cases benefit the community as a whole. In the United States, black immigrants from the Caribbean have enjoyed one of the highest economic growth rates using a form of the SUSU and leveraging this practice to establish successful credit unions. And a credit union is one of the most well-known forms of, uh, of a co-op because with the credit unions, the, the, the uh, people who have accounts with the credit unions are also owners. They're part owners of it as well. All right. Now, African-American business owners, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast, and we'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. We have low cost ways to help you market your business and reach thousands of uh, new customers uh, each week. And our current promotion is uh, buy one month, get uh, two months free. OK, buy one month, get two months free. That's only for a limited time only uh, while we have uh, inventory, while we have space available. And I can create a commercial for you. If you don't have one, we take your 30 second to 60 second commercial, put it into the um, rebroadcast of, of my shows. My shows on Monday through Friday, 11 p.m., normally 11 p.m. to midnight Eastern Standard Time. And we rebroadcast the shows throughout the day. And then also on Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time as well. So your uh, commercial will be in the rebroadcast of our shows, but also in the audio podcast uh, of our shows, also on 10 different audio podcast platforms, including Facebook podcasts. Uh, so they get uploaded. The audio podcast gets uploaded to our Facebook fan page here, the African History Network. We're on iHeartRadio, CastBox, FM Player, TuneIn, Blog Talk Radio, iTunes, Stitcher, a number of different um, audio podcast uh, platforms uh, as well. So email us at ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com, ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com. And we'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. We can get we can get your business up and running today. All right. Now, um, 
if we look uh, some more at the uh, co-ops in our history of cooperative economics, and it may be a co-op that you want to promote. Uh, you, your business may sell African jewelry. Uh, you may have a fitness website, maybe a personal trainer or fi sell fitness equipment. Uh, it may be an event coming up that you want to promote a conference, seminars, et cetera. You definitely want to advertise with the African History Network. But when we look uh, at our some more at our history uh, in with cooperative economics, one of them, uh, one of the early co-ops was the Free African Society. The Free African Society created in, uh, founded in 1787 by Richard Allen and Absalom Jones. Okay. And oftentimes, you know, if you go to business school and, and I graduated from Wayne State's business school back in the 1990s, um, we learned, you know, white business principles, but we didn't learn about the co-ops. Now I was studying African history at the same time and reading Dr. Jawanza Kajufu, uh, black economics and, uh, studying some other information, but in our classes, we didn't learn really about uh, the co-ops and the deep, rich history that African Americans have in cooperative economics. Also, we were taught we were taught white business principles. Now, in 1787, Richard Allen and Absalom Jones, uh, uh, who were prominent African American ministers in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, uh, formed the Free African Society. Now, this is 1787, and we're using the term African. They formed the Free African Society of Philadelphia, which is a mutual aid and religious organization. And this is another type of co-op that we had. And there were cooperatives that we had uh, that were designed to uh, raise money to buy uh, people out of slavery. OK, there were cooperatives that we had that were uh, that raised money to bury people when they died. Now, the organization, the Free African Society function as both a mutual aid society and a club a mutual aid society and a club uh where members of philadelphia's african-american elite could socialize and forge uh business relationships with one another now by 1794 by 1794 the society had become large enough to accomplish its original goal when members built uh, their own house of worship, uh, it was called St. Thomas uh, African Episcopal St. Thomas African Episcopal Church. Now, in addition to the church uh, providing assistance to the sick uh, and widowed, and the Free African Society uh, providing uh, assistance to the sick and widowed and orphaned members of Philadelphia's African American community, the Free African Society also extended its help to the city at large. The society's most famous contribution to the city of Philadelphia was the help uh, members provided during the yellow fever epidemic in 1793, uh, which killed thousands of Philadelphians. Now, blackpass.org has a really good, uh, some really good information there dealing with uh, the Free African Society, okay? And this is one of the institutions that we put in place to help empower African Americans and help fight against white supremacy and racism. So we have a deep, rich history of this and leveraging our economics to uh, push our agendas in, e even push political agendas also. All right, now uh, another example of uh, co-ops that we had, now this is the Color Merchants Association. This is a, a really, this is one of my favorite ones because this came out of the um, Negro Business League, the National Negro Business League. Color Merchants Association. And this was, you see Booker T. Washington there in the middle, in the front row. And this was designed to help African-American grocery store owners better compete against the white chain stores, the Kresge's and AMP's, Woolworth, things like this. Okay. So in 1928, uh, the National Negro Business League of Montgomery, Alabama, uh, established the Colored Merchants uh, Association, the CMA, the Colored Merchants Association, which was a uh, cooperative organization of African-American grocery stores. Uh, and one of the most popular types of businesses that we owned back at this time, late 1890s, 1880s, 1890s, early 1900s were grocery stores, but then also um, funeral homes and life insurance companies, okay? Because you have to eat, you're going to die. 
and you're going to need some life insurance, burial insurance, etc. OK, so this or the Color Merchants so Association, which is really not talked about a lot, came out of the National Negro Business League, which was founded by Booker T. Washington in 1900. And the um, uh, so the National Negro Business League established the Color Merchants Association, the CMA, which was a cooperative organization of African-American grocery stores. The purpose of the organization was to reduce the operating costs of black retailers through mutual support, reduce the operating costs of black retailers through mutual support, cooperative buying and collective marketing. So being able to buy in larger quantities, get a lower, get, get economies of scale, get a lower price, uh, pull resources together, have collective marketing so they can get better rates when they market in newspapers or different things like this. OK, and this was designed to help these African-American grocery stores better compete against the larger white owned chain stores. And uh, this was taking place in a harsh market dominated by white owned chain stores. The Color Merchants Association model, the Color Merchant Association's model was markedly successful. Associated stores reported increases in business and profits. Now, the association spread uh, to nearly 18 cities, including Chicago, Philadelphia, Nashville, uh, Dallas, and New York. The uh, Color Merchants Association built its national headquarters in New York City in October 1929. Chapters were organized in cities with 10 or more stores. Now, the uh, uh, members of the Colored Merchants Association paid $5 per month uh, per store and were required to meet designated standards, designated, designated standards. By 1930, 253 stores were part of the CMA network. So these are African-American owned grocery stores that are in this organization designed to help them to better compete okay now if you all are uh one african-american business owners post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast two if you're a member of a cooperative especially a food co-op now here in the detroit area we have black food security network okay um but if you're a member of a co-op especially a food co-op or something like that or a, co a co-op uh cooperative grocery store post the name of that as well All right, let's continue here. So uh, members received, members of the Colored Merchants Association received support services from the association, such as intensive training and in merchandising techniques, sales training, advertising, and management resources, such as market analysis, inventory, and bookkeeping systems, and uh, collection and credit procedures. Now, these are some things that hopefully the black chamber of commerce in your city is doing if not maybe a maybe you all can in that city create an african-american chamber of commerce that addresses some of these issues but these are some things that um you know i know in some cities uh the uh, black chambers of commerce are trying to address but they need you know support as well now, another um, cooperative, and this was probably probably one of the largest ones, this this one, the Colored Farmers National Alliance and Cooperative Union, founded in 1886 in Texas. This one grew to about 1.2 million members. OK, this one grew to about 1.2 million members. And when I get to the uh, there's a good article uh from vice.com that deals with uh, how black co-ops can fight institutional racism, because this is how one of the ways historically, uh, economically, we, we fought against white supremacy and racism through the cooperatives. And largely, this has been something that has not been taught in our history. And a lot of you know, African-Americans go to uh, business schools, they go to white business schools, uh, uh, predominantly white institutions, or they may go to business schools at, at some HBCUs and learn white business principles and don't and don't learn this type of information. OK, so. Um, 
what happens is a lot of these co-ops had to disband because they got threats from white people. They got threats from white supremacists. Uh, members were attacked, beaten, killed, etc. So a lot of uh, these uh, co-ops had to disband uh, just to save people's lives. OK, now the Colored Farmers National Alliance and Cooperative Union, the CFACU, was uh, founded in 1886 and it, uh, in Texas. Now, despite the fact that both African-American and white farmers faced great difficulties, um, faced great difficulties uh, due to the rising price of farming and the decreasing profits that were uh, coming from farming. OK, the protective organization known as the Southern Farmers Alliance did not allow African-American farmers to join. So you had a group of African-American farmers who, who got together and decided to organize their own alliance to fill their need. OK, and they call it the they call it, call it the Colored Farmers National Alliance and Cooperative Union. Now, the CFACU operated under fear and harassment by white farmers, but managed to uh, operate several cooperatives in the late 19th century before having to disband, before having to disband, because they were getting death threats and being attacked. Now, uh, members, of the, uh, C members of the CFACU shared agricultural techniques uh, and innovations and coordinated uh, cooperative efforts for planting and harvesting. The union promoted alliances uh, between farmers and laborers and was active in local and regional politics in order to maintain uh, rights for African-Americans after Reconstruction. Now, Reconstruction is 1865 to 1877, and I teach a uh, a class usually on Saturdays from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement of Black Power, 1865 to uh, 1968. Now, it's estimated that the uh, Colored Farmers National Alliance and Cooperative Union had 1.2 million members and was the largest black organization of its time. OK, they grew to 1.2 million members, but, um, you know, they they had to disband and you're going to see this. Oftentimes, where you have these organizations that are uh, being attacked by white supremacists, okay, not able to join white unions, not able to join white organizations, but then they get attacked by uh, uh, white supremacists when they become prosperous and organized amongst themselves. Now, this is a, uh, if you see some of my lectures, you hear me talk about the pyramid principle that two of my teachers, Dr. Lennon Jeffries and Professor James Small, teach about. And, you know, the uh, the foundation of the pyramid is African history and culture, which gives us our, our VIPs. It gives us our values, our interests, and our principles. And this influences the two sides of the pyramid, our economic empowerment and political empowerment. But it, it, but it also influences how we engage in economics. Okay, do we take white business principles and dress them up in red, black, and green? Okay, or, or do we operate based upon uh, uh, cultural uh business principles and cultural ways of doing business and cultural ways of structuring businesses. Okay. And this is something that the cooperatives uh, teach us. And once again, like I said, these are principles we brought with us from Africa. Okay. So the foundation of the pyramid is African history and culture. It's our history and culture that gives us our values, our interests and our principles, our VIPs. This gives us a cultural paradigm that we see reality through. And one side of the pyramid is our economic empowerment. The other side is the political empowerment. And we have to have a synthesis of, of all of these sides as well. We have to have a synthesis of all three of these, not just one. And when we look at all the, the great African civilizations that many people like to talk about, whether we talk about ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, whether we talk about uh, uh, Nubia, Ta-Nehisi, Abyssinia, uh, Songhai, Mali, Songhai, Great Zimbabwe, uh, Ghana, things like this. When you study those societies, they have some type of economic system. Okay, they're going to have some type of bartering, some type of trade, some type of monetary system. They're going to have some. Type, they're going to have some type of marketplace also. Okay, they're going to have some type of bartering system, some type of monetary system, whether it's gold, whether it's salt, some type of medium of exchange. They're going to have some type of um, uh, 
uh, uh, marketplace as well. Okay. So and when we look at all these different great African civilizations, so this is in our history. Okay. Now, if we, and those who just joining us, um, uh, Michael M. Hotel, host of the African History Network show, founder of the African History Network. Um, African American business owners, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast. And email us at AHN show at African History Network.com. We'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. Um, our current promotion right now is uh, buy one month, get two months free. Buy one month, get two months free is our current promotion. For a limited time only while we have inventory email us at ahn show at african history network.com ahn show at african history network.com we'll let you know how you can advertise with the african history network we take your um 30 second to 60 second commercial put it into the uh rebroadcast of my of my daily show and then it's also in the audio podcast version of my shows so we're on 10 different audio podcast platforms, iTunes, iHeartRadio, FM Player, Stitcher, CastBox, FM Podcast. And uh, we reach thousands of people uh, with, with, with each episode, okay? So email us at AHN show at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We can get you up and running today. Now, uh, I want to go back to this here. So we have the Color, uh, Colored Farmers Union and there was a there's a good article from uh, vice.com that deals with some more of this information um and i uh, this article is from 2016 august 9th 2016. i want to focus in on page six of this article you can read the entire article it's called how black co-ops can fight institutional racism and it's an interview with dr jessica gordon m hard who wrote the book collective courage okay and she's an expert on cooperative economics about the ways uh that african americans can join together through a capitalistic enterprise and create social change it's a really good article from vice.com now there, there are other articles uh interviews uh, with her as well news1.com has got one uh, also from a few years ago but if we i, I want to go to page six here specifically here's a picture of dr jessica gordon m hard but I want to focus in on page six that starts with um, how do co-ops function in a capitalistic system? Here's the cover of a book that I just showed you. Her book is fantastic. Like I said, th this type of information, I learned this in, in business school. In business school, we were taught white business principles. This is her book once again. And I interviewed her back about 2014. She was speaking here in Detroit. So I interviewed her and um, got her book and, and read articles about her and i was blown away by the information because in my research dealing with african history and african-american history that's how i really learned about the co-ops but not so much so in business school now and let me see i'm going to blow this up here um so how do co-ops function in a capitalistic system okay this is the question she was asked and when you know in in school we're we're, we're taught basically uh, white capitalism but we're not we're not taught about how the ways that african americans historically fought against that and how uh, a lot of our businesses were uh either structured as co-ops or belonged to co-ops so she said uh we have examples all over the world and sometimes how that looks is it's a small enterprise that allows smaller individuals to compete. It's a small enterprise that allows smaller individuals to compete. She said, take a group like Land of, Lake, Land of Lakes, Land of Lakes, which is one of the, uh, which is one of our largest agricultural corporations. She said, it's, it is actually a cooperative of dairy farmers that all own Land of Lakes together equally. And Land of Lakes buys its milk and products, all the dairy pro and, and Land of Lakes buys its milk and produces all the dairy products. So the co-op has factories, does all the production, does all the manufacturing, handles the business side that frees the farmers up to do their dairy farming, knowing that they have a market. 
okay, that frees the farmers up to do their dairy farming, knowing that they have a market. And, and when you look at um, the co-ops, especially from an African-American perspective, you see them implementing Ujima, the third principle of Kwanzaa, the third principle of the Nguza Saba, collective work and responsibility. Now, individually, they wouldn't be able to afford a production plan or afford uh, all of the advertising individually. But owning it all together, the individual farmers can now afford to compete. All right. So she was asked, uh, what role has cooperative economics played in black communities in the U.S.? OK, Dr. Jessica Gordon Nemhard said African-Americans have engaged in some form of collective economics throughout our entire history in America. And you go, you look at the Free African Society, there, there are numerous examples of this. OK, oftentimes we don't oftentimes we're not taught to focus on that and like connect all of this together. OK, but there are numerous examples of this. Now. Uh, she says sometimes it was uh, tilling kitchen gardens on Sundays uh, when we were not working as enslaved people and sharing the produce. Sometimes it was uh, putting in dues to bury loved ones. OK, because and, and you're going to have the uh, uh, mutual aid societies and the benevolent societies that are going to. Uh, raise money to bury uh, African Americans who 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 have died and uh, they didn't have life insurance, things like this. Now, by the 1700s, 1800s, we had more, more form formalized uh, systems of collective economics that were more enterprise driven, like insurance companies and collective farming. Eventually, we had collective grocery stores credit unions and healthcare. Europeans eventually recognized the model around 1844 and it formally came to the US, it formally came to, uh, to the US. African-Americans then started forming official co-ops in the 1860s and 1870s. By the 1880s, unions were actually helping workers to start their own co-ops and African-Americans were involved in that, too. And we know that labor unions are going to become really big after slavery ends, like the National Labor Union founded in 1866, American Federation of Labor founded in the 1870s, right around 1875. And a lot of these labor unions that white people are founding uh, are designed to lock African-Americans out of the skilled trades because, because there are at least 262 skills, trades, and crafts that we had in this country from 1865 to from 1619 to 1865. Okay. So as long as we uh, were doing those jobs for free, it was okay. But after slavery ends, now, now we can compete for these jobs. And this is something that um, the Freedmen's Bureau, the U.S. Freedmen of uh, Refugees, uh, the U.S. Bureau of Freedmen, Refugees, and Abandoned Lands, the Freedmen's Bureau, one of the things that the Freedmen's Bureau was doing was help, helping African Americans negotiate labor contracts. OK, uh, after slavery ends. So it becomes a problem because our skill set was as good as many white men in many cases better. OK, because we would have had a monopoly on the skill trades during slavery. OK, now now that we can compete for wages, now it's a problem. Now, by the 1880s, uh, labor unions were actually helping workers to start their own co-ops and African-Americans were involved in that, too. And we know that the uh, Industrial Revolution that starts in the 1790s in Manchester, England, we, uh, uh, we know the Industrial Revolution is going to cause the need for organized labor, okay? And, and these are the labor unions also uh, that were fighting for um, better working conditions for white people, especially white people working in the factories because the factories were unsanitary. They didn't have the um, uh, eight day, they didn't have the um, uh, five day work week. They didn't have the eight hour work day. Uh, you didn't have child labor laws, things like this, okay? So this is something that the labor unions are going to, and the whole labor movement is gonna help fight for. 
Now, she was asked a question. Um, did did co-ops play a role in the civil rights movement? Did uh, cooperatives play a role in the civil rights movement? OK, she said it, it she said it was what I call a silent partner to the movement. This was uh, done by African-Americans partly to survive outside of uh, U.S. capitalism, which was uh, so exploitative. It was also a way to create independence and wealth so we could be more politically active. All right. So you're going to see uh, it play a part there as well. Uh, so read the rest of this article here from uh, vice.com. This is um, how black co-ops can fight institutional racism, how black co-ops can fight institutional racism. This is from uh, April. Uh, April, this is from August 9th, 2016. OK, and this is an interview with uh, Dr. Jessica Gordon Nemhard. This is from August 9th, 2016 from vice.com. All right. OK, so uh, once again, African-American business owners, email us at AHN show at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We'll let you know how you can um, advertise with the African History Network. Uh, our current promotion is uh, buy one month, get two months free. Current promotion, buy one month, get two months free. And regardless of what type of business you have, it could be e-commerce of a business and and or brick or mortar store uh you may sell african cultural products african-american products african-american cultural products uh it could be clothing uh hair products health and beauty uh products as well uh shoes african garb books especially books for children are really big but uh history books you, know, you may uh, have a company where you sell um african history books african-american history books online or you may have a bookstore that could be books of fiction you may be a book author yourself uh self-help uh all different types of educational books financial literacy education is really big homeschooling uh you may own a home school you may have homeschool curriculum uh, a lot a, a lot more African-American parents are homeschooling their children as well. You may uh, teach about financial literacy. Uh, there may be events that you want to market, okay? Well, the events for Dr. King Day, African-American History Month, Juneteenth, um, uh, Women's History Month, etc. conferences, seminars. You may sell jewelry, African jewelry, uh, et cetera. You may have fitness websites. Email us at ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com. AHN show at africanhistorynetwork.com and we'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. Uh, you can also visit our website, africanhistorynetwork.com. Uh, we're on uh, six days a week, uh, basically Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to midnight Eastern Standard Time. And then uh, also on Sundays as well, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time as well. So visit our website, africanhistorynetwork.com uh, also. Okay. All right. Look, we have to get out of here. Remember, at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Hope everybody has a uh, prosperous 2022. Okay, Happy New Year to everybody. And uh, I'll look for your uh, emails. Talk to you next time. Peace. Remember, right now is correct. Wrong behavior is not over till we win. We're kind of forever. And uh, we'll talk to you next time. Mental health and well-being have long been a taboo subject in the so-called African-American community. So I enlisted the help of mental health experts, thought leaders, and activists to help kill the ghost of Willie Lynch and heal from post-traumatic slave syndrome. We experience trauma a lot of times um, on a subconscious level. So sometimes something happens to us and we know that it's traumatizing, but we don't really recognize the extent of the trauma. Kwanzaa is coming and the KwanzaaShop.com has all of your Kwanzaa needs. Order your Kwanzaa set today, which includes a Kanara, candles, a mat, a cup, the African American flag, and a basket. Visit the KwanzaaShop.com, the KwanzaaShop.com.
They have Kanara sets, which include a candle holder, candles, a mat, and a cup. Kwanzaa is December 26th through January the 1st. Add the early bird discount code for 10% off your order placed before November 28th. Visit thekwanzashop.com and place your order today. Thekwanzashop.com has all of your Kwanzaa needs to celebrate this African-American Pan-African holiday. Thekwanzashop.com Soul in Motion, celebrating 38 years in the arts. This energetic ensemble of dancers and drummers was started by percussionist Michael Friend and is led by choreographer, associate director Pam Lassiter. Based in the Washington, D.C. area, Soul in Motion is now accepting bookings for Black History Month, Juneteenth, and summer festivals in 2022. Soul in Motion is also available for more intimate events like naming ceremonies and weddings. To find out more or book your date, call 240-452-1349 or send an email to info at soulinmotion.org. Be sure to check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Soul in Motion celebrating our history, our culture, our future. Soul in Motion. Theater, African dance, and drumming since 1984. Black on Purpose Television Network. Yes, Black on Purpose Television Network. All black, all positive, all the time. The largest black-owned streaming television network in the world. Bringing our people together worldwide. Controlling our messages, our story, our way. Black TV, the way it should be. Black music, black history, and more. 30 plus channels, thousands of shows. Black on Purpose Television Network. Subscribe now. Gain knowledge in minutes from insightful summaries of progressive and socially conscious books. Blacklisted gives you access to curated content that'll satisfy your curiosity to learn and understand different perspectives. Empower yourself through inspirational and actionable ideas. It's easy to read or listen to on the go. Blacklisted, empower yourself. Start your free trial today. Are you getting ready for fall or winter? We have the solution for all seasonal clothing needs. Cometicwear.com is the go-to online source for Cometic African fashion and lifestyle products with a contemporary twist. Committed to offering unique styles reflecting our African heritage. Cometicwear.com is inspired by Cometicscribes.com to influence our people in learning and showing pride. Please visit our website at Cometicwear.com. We all know the cannabis industry is headed toward an uprise in the past decade. What happens when there is a brand that brings this uprise in a blow? The cannabis industry welcomes her uprise. Hustle her hemp. Delivering excellence with pride is her watchword, and how you choose to embrace it makes it a priority. From cultivating rich cannabis into exquisite and tastefully finished CBD products to delivery, Hustler Hemp leaves no stone unturned. Hustle Her Hemp's mission is to empower women of color by building business and creating legacies, uniting beauty, health, and business. We are a pure definition of how we want the CBD industry to become in the future. 
While we are redefining innovation, we bring the same energy to improving the quality of life. Hustle Her Hemp is the new Uprise. Hi, I'm Joel Wilson, President and CEO of JCW Computer Consulting LLC, a technology implementation firm with over 20 years of satisfying customers. We offer a full spectrum of industry top tier branded services. We are an authorized partner or reseller for Lenovo, Zoom, T-Mobile, Microsoft 365 and Surface Tablets, Google Workspace, Acer, Asus, Samsung, PCmatic security software, and many more. Our online store features laptops, Chromebooks, computers, printers, accessories, and software. Businesses, take advantage of our free one-hour Zoom tech consultation and know we offer top nationwide high-speed internet service providers, voice over IP, and cellular phone services. Home users, don't miss our current in-stock Chromebook inventory. Please visit us at jcwcc.com or call 215-879-6701. iRedify is a black-owned digital platform that showcases black and brown cultures and people. The books on the platform are written by African-American authors, Afro-Caribbean authors, African authors, and so much more. Kids 14 and under can read ebooks, listen to audiobooks, and complete learning activities. Kids can even write in the books digitally. Get unlimited access to everything on the platform for only $8.99 a month at iRedify.com. Sign up for your membership today. Come and travel with me to a time long ago and place far away. You will experience high adventure and excitement. You are fighting alongside an ancient army in fierce battle. Feel the exhilaration of struggle and final conquest. My name is Maninkare and I am both a prince and a priest in one of the most advanced civilizations humans have ever produced. I want you to ride with me in my chariot as I slay the barbarians who have come to invade my land. I invite you to sit at the conference table with the great Pharaoh Taharqa and his ministers as they plan intrigue and use subterfuge to outmaneuver and defeat the enemy. Come back with me to the land of your ancestors, to the beautiful land of Kemet. So open the pages of this book and begin the adventure. Find out what happens in the book Maninkare Battles the Assyrians in the Nile Valley from author Makari Jones. Get your copy today at Amazon.com.